My colleague, Olivier Blain, Jean-François Montreuil, Cathy Eyre, Grandi Inkin, and myself, Louis Corriveau, we would like to provide you a broader review of critical metals in mineral system with iron oxide, copper, gold, and affiliated critical metal deposits. To do so, we will be using the superb field exposure of the Great Bear Magmatic Zone that is located in Northern Canada. The Great Bear exposed along 450 kilometer long belt, uh, comprised quite a variety of mineral prospects and mineral occurrences with the following uh, metal enrichment and endowment, as well as two deposits, Sudayam, which is a Bonafide OCG deposit, and Nico, which is an iron-rich gold cobalt bismuth copper deposit. Mapping and geochronology across the belt indicate that all those mineral systems were formed coevally and uh, through the ascent of voluminous hypersaline to saline fluid plumes that were pulled in the mid cross and ascend towards surface and laterally along fault zones. Doing so, during ascent, they develop a whole series of consecutive alteration facies where there was continuous recharge and discharge of metals in the fluid plume through the regional scale intense metasomatism. As the fluid plume rise, it also induced a steep thermal gradient towards surface. As the fluid plume reacts, the first thing it's going to do is albitite corridor along fall zone and subvolcanic intrusion. For example, we have here an andesite that has been totally albitized along one of those corridors. In the process, all the minerals have been of the O's has been transformed into albite. Any elements that were not stable in albite have gone to the fluid plume and sodium, aluminum, and silica are now stable within that uh, albitite. But as soon as the albitite corridors are formed, the fluid change uh, physical con uh, chemical conditions. If there are carbonates, it will precipitate scum. But after that, it's going to form a high temperature calcium iron alteration species with amphibole, magnetite, apatite, and epidote, as well as precipitating light error, thorium, vanadium, or tungsten. Most systems will go directly to a high temperature potassium iron alteration species where kefir sparbitite, magnetite, and copper sulfides are stables. There is also precipitation of gold, silver, some cobalt, very little, some rare earths, and some uranium. But really, in sedimentary basin, there will be a transitional species of high temperature calcium potassium iron alteration with amphibole magnetite by biotite kefir spa, as well as a whole series of cobalt and bismuth minerals, as well as in some cases nickel and precipitation of gold, but copper will be very small at that point. At the high temperature potassium iron alteration species, this is where we're precipitating bona fide AOCGs that belong to the magnetite group. And then that the low temperature potassium iron alteration facies with its variants with calcium and magnesium, fluorine or CO2, then we will be precipitating quite a variety of copper sulfides, hematite group OCGs, as well as silver, gold, light rare, uranium, molybdenum, some tungsten, some cobalt. At the end, towards surface, we will be forming epithermal system, and across the system, we will also be forming vein type uh, mineralization and lots of quartz and carbonate veins. As the fluid plume reacts with host rocks, as I said, it totally changes mineral assemblage, which means it's also totally changed its bulk rock composition. And to portray that, we have developed a barcode of sodium, calcium, iron, potassium, and magnesium where most hosts in your sedimentary rocks, and of course the metamorphic derivative, will contain three or four dominant cations. The andesite I just showed you will be somewhere around here. However, as soon as the andesite does transform into albitite, like most other alteration species, the 
bulk rock compositions only, only have one, two or three dominant cations. In the case of albitite, it only has sodium, as only albite really is the dominant mineral. So if we look at the evolution of the whole system as it rises towards surface, then you can see that each alteration species and the transition will have very, very significantly different composition, each with one or two or at the maximum of three barcodes that will dominate. For this talk, I will show you a bit of the data from the Josette River deposits in Quebec, which occur at the high temperature calcium iron alteration facies. We will look at the critical metal rich, uh, iron rich cobalt bismuth gold deposit, taking as an example the Nico deposits in Canada in the Great Bear Magnetic Zone. And then we will also look at the critical metal contents of the Olympic Dam deposit, which is the archetype AOCG deposit. At NICO, we're getting 33 million tons of resources in gold, cobalt, bismuth, and some copper. This largely happened at facies 2 to 3, high temperature calcium, potassium, iron. But when we map the NICO deposit and get outside of it, within the, and map the whole system, we can see that the whole siltstones and carbonate rocks will first be extremely uh, albitized, going from a long fall zone and stratobond alteration to a lot more intense and either beautiful stratobond alteration like this one or totally massive albitite. Carbonates will be transformed into scones, which will soon be replaced by amphibole and amphibole magnetite alteration facies at the high temperature calcium iron alteration. Then we move on to the precipitation of biotite and amphibole biotite magnetite and precipitation of gold, cobalt, and bismuth. As the system moves to the KFE alteration, then it will start precipitating calcopyrite. If we go to the bulk rock composition, we start with the barcodes of the siltstone, move to the albitite, then the high temperature calcium iron alteration facies, then the high temperature calcium iron and potassium alteration facies, moving into biotite rich, uh, potassium rich, uh, uh, potassium iron alteration facies, where copper precipitate within the deposit. Then above nickel, there is a few prospects that are bona fide AOCG breccia. And to the west of the Nico deposit, there is a huge albitite corridor that was trusted against the Nico area and overprinted by the potassic iron alteration. And interestingly enough, all the uranium of the system seems to, be, to have been trapped in this uh, albitite hosted uh, region. If we plot the barcodes on the log diagram and compare with bulk rock composition, we can see that the nickel deposit is significantly enriched in gold, in indium, in bismuth, in tungsten, and in cobalt, while the rocks that were affected by potassic iron alteration facies are enriched in uranium and copper, and to some extent they have enrichment locally in light rare earth. If we use the reserves of the Nico deposit and compare it with the resources of deposit, we can see that Nico has a lot more cobalt uh, concentration than Olympic Dam, for example, than the Sudbury, Sudbury magnetic nickel copper deposit. However, the Blackbird resources uh, in the, the US were even richer in terms of resources. Nickel is iron oxide rich. Blackbird is very similar, but it's iron silicate rich. If we look at the bismuth and compare it with bismuth uh, mine and deposits, then we can see that nickel has very high content. And if we look at the partitioning of element, then we can see with the barcodes that the nickel deposit is as uranium content that are much lower than continental cross values, while the southern breccia with its potassic iron alteration 
is much enriched in uranium. If we take Olympic Dome, we have a granite that gets brecciated, it gets potassic altered, and then more and more infilled and replaced by emetite. The barcodes evolve towards very, very, very iron rich component. And as it does so, the copper increase. Now, if we look at the critical metal endowment of the Olympic Dam deposit, based on 10,000 geochemical analysis provided by BHP, then we can see that there's quite significant enrichment of rare earth compared to the uh, continental cross values, as well as in gold, tellurium, silver, uh, bismuth, moly, tungsten, uh, and especially copper and rare earth, and especially the light rare earth. Currently, what is being extracted from the mine is gold, silver, uranium, and copper. If we look for heavy rare earths, then we have to go to the high temperature calcium iron alteration species, where iron oxide apatite deposit form. However, if we look at the high temperature calcium iron on the rock chondrite um, rare diagram, it will plot along that green line. Iron oxide apatite deposit will plot along this pink line from the, and it's all, this is all from the Great Bear. However, as soon as you remobilize or recrystallize IOA deposit, then you can form heavy rare earth rich ore zones through remobilization of the rare earths into apatite brittolite veins, such as those rosette, or to rare earth rich breccia, such as peerage. In the Great Bear, along the major fault zone, there has been huge recrystallization of IOA mineralization, and that's where we're finding our highest uh, rare earth values among all the prospects. If we plot the barcodes of the Kujibo system and it shows a deposit, then we can see that the heavy rare earth enriched rocks and the light rare earth enriched rocks are both the uh, high temperature calcium iron alteration, the IOA mineralization that has been remobilized as a vein with apatite and bright brittolite. So that partitioning of element we can see across entire systems with each alteration species forming distinct uh, deposit types. Each alteration species also form very distinct metal association. And this is very important because it tells us that if we have any of those species, we should be looking for this type of deposit and this type of metal association. In addition, if we find one alteration species in an area, then we should be looking for the others and we should be looking for where the others could be extremely abundant. And here, geophysics can be an extremely important tool. However, if the systems just so simply go from bottom to top without disturbance, then it's uncertain that you can form significant deposit. What you want is the system playing yo-yo through emplacement of magma, uh, like renewed um, uh, dikes, uh, ultramafic, fersic, whatever, it will bring the temperature of your system to a higher level. It will allow to, the system to go back to higher temperature alteration phases, cool down again, precipitate the metal that comes with uh, the alteration phases that is cooler. And if you have more magma, you're going back down, you're going back up, you're going back down, you're going back up. If you're bringing external low temperature fluid within your fluid flow, then you go up and you have the ability to make uh, uh, other type of deposits. And it's the same thing through faulting. And also if you have different at all rocks or if your fluid plume has different oxidation state, then you may not only form iron oxide deposit, but also iron carbonate, iron silicate, iron sulfide rich variants. And that is to be kept in mind. So you can put all your alteration uh, observation within this diagram for each of your deposit and start prospecting 
and start interpreting your system and the prospectivity of your region. For example, if you find Oak Dam East, you should be looking for Oak Dam West. In Australia, it took 20 years to go to do that step and find a major OCG deposit in addition to the NAP Dam deposit. And let's not forget that each of those alteration species can crisp the extremely high content of any commodities, such as the Merlin deposit. So I would like to say thank you so much for all of those who help us, in particular, Fortune Minerals and Robin Gold, who have allowed us to study the NICO deposit. We have a GAC special paper coming out uh, very soon, and we will have a, a short course at the GAC MAC meeting in Halifax, and I welcome you uh, to our short course. And I look forward to discussing any uh, of your ideas or any of your uh, mineral system. Thank you so much. <laughs>